Hello, everyone. It's always a blessing for me to share what the Lord gives from His Word. And I pray that it's a blessing to every listener. During our recent youth camp, I focused on the land of promise, the good land, and how the Israelites failed to remember all the miracles God did for them from the time they left Egypt. Throughout the wilderness journey, they exaggerated the difficulties of the land and undermined its capacity to make them fruitful. Though they saw his works, they quickly forgot. Worst of all, they never took God's word seriously. Their continual unbelief tested God's patience, and in the end, it cost them the land of promise. As it says in Hebrews 3, verse 19, so we see that it was because of their unbelief that they were unable to enter. Jesus saw his own disciples descending into a state of lethargy. They'd seen many miracles, heard his teaching, were constantly with him, yet their hearts were growing unresponsive. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. We will touch briefly the events that lead up to verses 22 through 26, the point of this lesson. In the first 10 verses, we see the miracle of Jesus feeding the 4,000. The disciples didn't understand the significance of this miracle or the one in which 5,000 were fed just two chapters before this. In both miracles, we read that the people ate and were satisfied. The actual Greek term used means to fatten, to gorge. In other words, their tummies were filled to the brim. Both of these miracles point to Jesus as the bread of life. He is the all-sufficient God who gives liberally. He gives beyond what we expect. Verses 11 through 13 show Jesus has an encounter with the Pharisees. And, and I quote, sighing deeply in his spirit, unquote. He leaves them in their hardness of heart. Verses 14 to 16 tells us that disciples get into a boat and soon realize they have forgotten to take bread and are debating over what is to be done. When Christ warns them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, they think he is rebuking them for their forgetfulness. Jesus had just demonstrated that he is all they need. How is it they still don't understand? Have they been too long under the influence of the empty teachings of the Pharisees? Have their own prejudices become an obstacle to understanding spiritual things? Whatever the reason, Jesus is deeply concerned over the hold it has over their minds. How can he get through to them? Pastor and author Brian Bell uses hyperbole, exaggeration, to press this point with the following illustration. Some people need some extra help to get it right. It's like the man who went into a bank and said he wanted some money. The teller asked him to make out a check, but the man would not do it. So the teller said, sir, if you won't sign the check, I can't give you any money. The man shrugged his shoulders and went across the street to another bank and had the same conversation with another teller. In response, that teller reached across the counter, took the man by the ears, and banged his head three times on the counter, after which the man took out a pen and calmly signed a check. The man returned to the first bank and said, They gave me money across the street. The teller looked confused and asked, 
How did that happen? The man rubbed his head and said, he explained it to me. Mr. Bell continues, keep this little illustration in mind as we look into verses 17 through 21. Jesus is banging his disciples' heads with nine rapid-fire questions. Why do you reason because you have no bread? Bang. Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Bang. Is your heart still hardened? Bang. Having eyes do you not see? Bang. And having ears do you not hear? Bang. How is it that you do not understand? Bang. When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you collect? Twelve. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you collect? Seven. Do you still not understand? Bang, bang, bang. It's a funny illustration, but you get the idea. The disciples had become dull in their thinking, and the Lord was rightfully upset. What causes a believer's heart to become dull in spirit? Christ has spoken about leaven. Leaven is a small lump of yeast that works through the whole dough to make bread rise. Jesus was using it as an example of how sin works its way into the heart until the whole mind and heart is affected. It could be any sin. In this case, hardness of heart, a precursor to unbelief. Matthew's account shows to what length Christ went to help them understand. Matthew 16, verses 11 and 12. How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Whew. They got it. They understood Jesus wasn't upset by bread. He was speaking of the false doctrine and man-made traditions of the Pharisees. He used the concept of leaven to show the nefarious nature of sin. Like leaven, sin doesn't stay dormant. It spreads quickly and overtakes every part of your life. It says in James 1.15, Then, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's run its course, brings forth death. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. To see also means to understand. Oh, I see. Now I understand. He wants us to understand everything he does and speaks. It has a purpose. It's this next miracle which I've been leading up to, the healing of a blind man. It gives hope to every lethargic heart. This event is covered only in Mark's gospel and may have been recorded through Peter's influence since he himself has a personal connection with it. The manner in which Christ heals this blind man is a graphic illustration of how he works in a hardened heart. We see a darkened soul slowly brought into the light by the Holy Spirit. Mark 8, chapters 22, verses 22 to 26. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a man who was blind to Jesus and begged him to touch him. Taking the man who was blind by the hand, he brought him out of the village. And after spitting in his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again he laid his hands on his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored, and began to see everything clearly. 
And he sent him back to his home saying, Do not even enter the village. Bethsaida was a moderate fishing town located where the Jordan River feeds into the Sea of Galilee. It is also the city where Christ had preached the gospel of salvation and had done many miracles. But it didn't produce the desired effect. The people remained indifferent and unrepentant. Christ pronounced judgment on Bethsaida and her two neighboring cities, Chorazin and Capernaum. Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 24, tells us he cursed them because they didn't repent. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Archaeologists believe El Araj site is the ruins of first century Bethsaida. All mention of this city disappeared by the second century, less than a hundred years after Christ's judgment. Only buried ruins remain as a testament against it, as well as Capernaum and Chorazin. Think about it. The city of Athens, Greece is still around and flourishing, as is Damascus, Syria, and Jerusalem. Christ's judgment against Bethsaida, Capernaum, and Chorazin was so complete that even the surrounding areas to this day show little or no sign of human habitation. Archaeologists have also discovered the remains of a 5th century Byzantine church built over the ruins of a home thought to be that of the apostles Andrew and Peter. According to John 1 verse 44, Bethsaida was their home. We might wonder, could this city have contributed to the dullness in spirit? Their dullness in spirit? The Lord's judgment on this city and the neighboring cities must have shocked his disciples, especially Peter. As soon as they entered Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. It's evident that this man had concerned friends, but the man himself seems impervious, indifferent as to whether he is healed or not. He didn't ask to be healed. He may reflect the general apathy of this village. It is not surprising that Jesus took him by the hand and brought him out of the village. Look at the steps carefully laid by Jesus to raise this man's faith. After spitting on his eyes, Remember the murky, muddy waters of the Jordan River that brought about Naaman's healing? Spitting on the blind man's eyes seems just as humiliating. That happened to me once publicly when I was a kid, and my humiliation was beyond words. Recall the soldiers who spit on Christ prior to his crucifixion. I don't think it was a sprinkle it was saliva drifting all over his face and down his beard. They did it, of course, to humiliate him. In Revelations 3, verse 16, Jesus uses this word against a lukewarm, indifferent, lethargic church. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Some versions say, I will vomit. I don't see anything pleasant or appealing in him spitting on this blind man's eyes. What was he conveying here? His disciples observed everything the Savior spoke and did. Seeing Christ spit on the man must have made them recoil. Did he do it to shock his disciples, to make them aware that they are spiritually blind? Charles Spurgeon gave a sermon on this miracle on July 22, 1866. Regarding the spittle, he says, Of course, spiritual eyesight comes by means of spiritual truth. It seems to me that the association which we naturally put with spittle 
is that of disgust. And this was intentionally used by the Savior for that very purpose. Jesus Christ will open thine eyes, and it may be by this ignoble, humbling means, the spittle of his mouth. We must look up, after all, to the Lord and giver of every good gift, or else the spittle must be wiped away in disgust. So spittle is one of those good gifts from the Lord. Perhaps at the onset, it's a shocking method. But after a gentle touch, Jesus asked the blind man, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. After the touch of the master's hands, the film over the blind man's eyes wasn't quite yet removed, but he could see for the first time. Yes, it was blurry, but he's no longer in total darkness. His senses have been awakened. Oh, but surely he would desire to see more. If this level is possible, surely the complete miracle is at hand. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes. Whatever method Christ uses, the outcome will be wonderful. There are those times when he puts his thumb on an obstinate sin in my life. I find when I accept his method, even if it's repulsive or humiliating, I feel his great tenderness towards me. The result is, I trust him all the more with my life. I want to obey him with all my heart. I don't want to be left in my deception. I don't want to remain blind to what is the truth about me or about him. I want to read that a second time. I don't want to be left in my deception. I don't want to remain blind to what is the truth about me or about him. Hebrews 12, 11, For the moment, all discipline seems not to be pleasant but painful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And he looked intently. By this time, the man was eagerly straining to see. In a moment, his faith was complete and his sight was restored. I don't think it was just his physical eyes. No, his spirit was awakened and he began to see everything clearly. Oh, I see. Now I'm beginning to understand. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. And Jesus sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. Jesus warns him to keep his faith and his healing. He wants him to keep his faith and his healing. Because what does Satan do? He comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. John 10.10 10. Don't go back to the spiritually blind state you were in. Don't go back to where the devil will rob you of your victory. The place where he will bring doubts of God's healing, doubts of God's goodness, doubts of God's all-sufficiency. What can we learn from this healing of the blind man? Well, we open the lesson with how lethargy or indifference affects our faith how it dulls our senses. We want that love relationship with Christ to be vibrant. We want to stay alert. You know the children's game, hide and seek. The leader covers his eyes and slowly counts to 50 out loud while the others scramble to hide. Then he cries out, Ready or not, here I come. Ready or not, 
Jesus is coming. Though he delay, he's coming. Darkness is creasing throughout the world. We don't want it to dim or put out our light. I found this quote in a sermon online. I've heard darkness defined as the absence of light. But this will not do because darkness is violent. Its purpose is to extinguish, to put out the light. The truth is, we will all have those times of doldrums when the wind of vibrant faith is no longer in our sails and we just stagnate. What can we do when we sense lethargy taking hold of us? It's not enough that we see or read about miracles. The city of Bethsaida confirms this. Rock Lagoya, a professor at Grace Theological Seminary in Indiana, he gives good advice. And I quote, Got a cold heart towards the Lord? You can reverse that cooling trend by taking steps to rekindle your love for Christ. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, Revelations 2.5. Every believer can remember what his relationship with Christ was like at the beginning. Well, do the deeds you did at first, Revelation 2.5. The deeds you did at first were prompted by love, not obligation. Once your heart is revived again, you will be enthusiastic to obey him. In John 16, 24, Jesus says, Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Unquote. When your soul is renewed, your heart is filled once again with his joy. Lethargy's gone. So, ask. And I'd like to conclude with One of my favorite scriptures, Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 30. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Galatians 6, 8. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Thank God Jesus doesn't let us stay in our lethargy. He has his ways of, if needs be, banging our heads to bring us back into reality. Sometimes he must use painful, humiliating things like that divine spittle, but always with the purpose to open our eyes to see, to really see him. He is the all-sufficient God. John 16, 24. Jesus says, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful word of encouragement. Amen. Amen.